Robert, thank you so much for your music today and for all of the musicians today. And really during the Advent and Christmas season, it gets a little sad as we approach that 12th day of Christmas and understand that the Christmas music is about to come to an end. Uh, but uh, we look forward to 11 months from now when we get to hear it again. And of course, throughout the year, we still have beautiful music here at First Baptist Church. And we give thanks for that this morning. I would like to invite you to turn in your Bibles or device to today's focus passage, which is Luke chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 41 through 52, if you'd like to follow along in your own Bible or device. Once again, Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. Each year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to their custom. After the festival was over, they were returning home, but the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't know it. Supposing that he was among their band of travelers, they journeyed on for a full day while looking for him among their family and friends. When they didn't find Jesus, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and putting questions to them. Everyone who heard him was amazed by his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were shocked. His mother said, child, why have you treated us like this? Listen, your father and I have been worried. We've been looking for you. Jesus replied, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he had said to them. Jesus went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. His mother cherished every word in her heart. Jesus matured in wisdom and years and in favor with God and with people. Valor and I were moving through our Christmas movies just a few weeks ago. And we began watching Home Alone. You know, the movie where the child is separated from his parents when they go off to vacation and he's left at home. And then the next year... When he gets on the wrong plane and goes to New York, when his family goes to Florida. Those two movies, I was watching it, and I couldn't help but think that I had heard this story before. And knowing that I was anticipating the first Sunday of Christmas, or the second Sunday of Christmas, and that I'd be preaching on the boy Jesus in the temple and being separated from his parents, I thought to myself while watching the movie, I wonder if John Hughes or Christopher Columbus had any idea or if they found some piece of inspiration for their story from Jesus being separated from his parents on this journey to and from Jerusalem. The movies Home Alone and Home Alone 2 Lost in New York are going on 30 years old now, if you can believe it. So I don't need to explain the whole plot to you. Most of you are probably familiar with Home Alone, at least to some degree. The boy is left behind. In the first one, his parents go to Paris, and he's left at home. In the second movie, Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, he gets on the wrong plane to go to New York. And he's ultimately left fending for himself while his mom and family tries to make it back to him as fast as possible. The biggest challenge in these two movies are fending off two burglars, Harry and Marv, who were out to get Kevin after he ruins their plans to burglarize his home and a toy store in New York. Now, spoiler alert, mom makes it home both times. Kevin's fine. And after a few awkward seconds, there are hugs all around and all is forgiven. Until the next movie, of course, when it happens all over again the next year, but but we'll talk about that another time. There's a common element in both movies that are not necessarily a major plot point, and it's the hilarity when Kevin gets out and does something adultish when he is only a 10-year-old boy, or maybe younger. He might be eight in the movie. I forget exactly. But the common element in Home Alone 1, Kevin makes a trip to the grocery store to get some groceries for his family when he notices that he's out of a few things. So he goes to pick up detergent and macaroni and cheese and milk and other items. He starts putting the items on the checkout and the cashier looks at him like like she's seen him on America's Most Wanted. He says, are you alone? Where's your mom? Where's your dad? Where are your siblings? Where do you live? Because boys don't do responsible things and shop for groceries. 
And then in Home Alone 2, he's checking into the Plaza Hotel, the most luxurious hotel in New York. He walks up to the counter to check in. The person asks, are you here to check in? Is it a reservation for yourself? And then Kevin proceeds to give his dad's credit card to the cashier and charges the room. There are no less than a few commonalities between today's gospel reading and what we watch in Home Alone and Home Alone 2. Maybe the most obvious is a child being separated from parents for days on end, and that is a remarkable part of the story that I have more than a few questions about for Mary and Joseph. But I can't help but think that Luke didn't intend for us to hone in on this story like it's home alone. I don't think that we're supposed to focus too much on the craziness of Jesus, of Jesus being left or, or being separated from his parents. I think Luke invites us to be amazed by something else. The boy in the temple doing adult or mature things like listening and asking questions and seeking to understand the faith that even adults have a hard time doing. The passage that we read today is often used on Children's Sunday or Youth Sundays because we like to use it as an example of what it means to be a, a faithful child. Maybe not honing in on the home alone parallels quite so much on those days, but we say to our young people, this is your example. Like Jesus in the temple, make your way to church, even if you have to run from your parents to do so. And you too can grow in wisdom and in faith. But I think the challenge for us today extends beyond lessons on how to be a good and faithful Christ-like teenager or child. Our challenge should come from what Jesus did while he was there. While Jesus spent days in the temple, we can learn a critical lesson for children, teenagers, and yes, adults. Because what we observe Jesus doing is something the body of Christ needs to do more this year. And the implications might be perfect for anyone looking for a New Year's resolution or for a way to get started on the right foot in 2021. We reach the part of God's story where we begin to move through the life of the main character, Jesus Christ. For the past few weeks, we've talked about the infancy of Jesus. Next week, we will talk about the baptism of Jesus and the beginning of his ministry as an adult. But today we hone in on the only gospel passage that is not about Jesus' infancy or his adult ministry. We hone in on a time in Jesus' life when he was 12 years old and his family is going to the temple for the festival. Jesus is reared to be a faithful Jew. And after this family, after this festival, the family returns home. They start out likely with a, a large group of family members, and Jesus goes missing. He's found after three days of searching, and he's in the temple. Now, look, when I was 12 years old, if I went missing, let's just say after church. Let's say it's Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night, and I go missing. I am probably not going to be in the sanctuary talking with my Bible teachers about how to become a better Christian. I'm probably at the gas station next door to the church getting a soda, or I'm playing hide-and-seek outside with some friends, or I'm running around the church doing whatever. I would not have been like Jesus at 12 years old. The chances are I would not have been engaged in theological or spiritual dialogue after church if my parents came looking for me. But Jesus was not hiding out at the temple to get back at his parents. Jesus was at the temple doing that which is most important. He was asking questions of the leaders who were listening to him. 
Now, our first thought of this passage is is that this first instance of Jesus in the temple, we imagine Jesus the child taking down the Pharisees and religious teachers just like he does in his adult ministry, showing some great sense of domination or subverting the religious teachings of that time. But the text doesn't say that. The text doesn't imply that. The boy Jesus was asking questions about the sacred texts. The boy Jesus was listening to the others there. It was a posture of understanding and gaining wisdom and growing. What a concept. What a concept, asking questions and listening to others. All those who were present were amazed. And I think that was the author's invitation for us to be amazed by what the boy Jesus was doing in the temple that day. You see, most 12-year-old kids or 18-year-old kids or 37-year-old kids or 60-year-old kids or 80-year-old kids aren't going to be this engaged with the faith. And Luke is calling out to us, asking us if we too will be as faithful as Jesus. Mary asked Jesus, why have you done this? We've been so worried. And Jesus says, why would you look anywhere else? I I had to be here, didn't you know? We may wonder when Jesus knew he was the Christ and what that entailed, but this passage tells us that it was pretty early on that Jesus fully understood and knew what his life would be about and what he was called to do and what he had come to do. And so we choose to take his call seriously. We read that Mary cherished his growth and understanding and maturity in her heart, which continued on through the years. And there ends our glimpse at the adolescence of Jesus Christ. I want to pause for a moment and acknowledge something perplexing about our text today, because you may be asking what I ask every time I open this text. How does God in the flesh flesh mature? How does the word of God among us mature? I think we all acknowledge that Jesus grows physically, but does Jesus grow intellectually, emotionally, theologically, and spiritually? The text tells us that Jesus matured in years, but also in wisdom. There is something about the nature of Jesus as fully human and fully God that will always be difficult for us to grasp even today. But let's not let that defer from the truth we read in God's story today. It tells us that Jesus sought to grow and to mature, and so should we. Because our very calling and our very purpose and what we've been called to do as the body of Christ depends on this. You see, in the next few weeks, we will be in the Gospel of Luke, and we'll be invited to explore and reflect on the baptism of Jesus, the calling of the disciple, Jesus' healing on the Sabbath, his raising of the widow's son. We'll hear the parable of the Good Samaritan, of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. We'll read the story of the rich man and Lazarus, Zacchaeus, the wee little man. And Palm Sunday, the Last Supper, the crucifixion, and the resurrection, we'll hear all of that in the coming months. And I can't help but think that Luke included this story of Jesus' childhood to show what makes this Christ child remarkable and awe-inspiring, and to remind us that a prerequisite to ministry requires listening and questioning and being present with a faith community as necessary to our growth in the faith. At the very least, when trying to wrap our minds around this concept of Jesus growing, we can learn the importance of studying the Scriptures for faith and practice. We can learn the importance of learning in community and not in pure isolation. We can learn the importance of nurturing 
others in the faith. Now, they, that may not seem as awe-inspiring or as crazy as parents being separated from a child in this story or in Home Alone or Home Alone 2, but maturing in the faith through asking questions, listening to others, and sitting in Christian community is an amazing challenge for us today as we begin this new year. And it's one that I'd like to invite you to take part in, First Baptist Church. I was recently listening to a podcast about New Year's resolutions. Because like many of you, if I have ever made any New Year's resolution, it's likely doomed to fail pretty quickly, in fact. But the, but the podcast went on to talk about how we imagine... New Year's resolutions as being successful only with those who have great willpower. So if someone makes a New Year's resolution to exercise, they need great willpower to be able to do that in the first few weeks and months and throughout the year. It takes great willpower, we think. But the podcast told us that it's actually not so much about Willpower. It's more about developing a habit. If you make a New Year's resolution to exercise, you need to develop a habit of doing so and get rid of those things that would keep you from developing that habit. So if your gym is 30 minutes away, that's a pretty significant obstacle to keeping your New Year's resolution to work out. It might be more helpful to get something at home is the point. You have to develop a habit in order for it to take effect. So how about in this new year, church, we develop some habits. Let's develop some habits based on what the boy in the temple did this day. Let's make it a habit to sit and to be present in the faith community. Let's make it a habit to ask questions. Let's make it a habit to listen intently to God and to each other. Let's make it a habit to sit with our faith community whenever we can. Eventually that means, hopefully, prayerfully, very soon, sitting in this place together again, in our Sunday school classrooms, and in our homes, and in coffee shops, learning the scripture together, sitting together. But in the meantime, we can still sit together remotely, virtually, distancing as we seek to get through this pandemic Jesus sat with, other, with the others at the temple for days. And I think it echoes the words of the author of Hebrew who says to the early church, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Let's meet together and stir up each other to love and good works. Let's also make it a habit to ask questions of each other and of the faith that we share and practice together. I think we've made it to think that we, we can't always ask questions of the Bible or of our faith practice. We're, we're reluctant to dig deeper in the faith, and that may be the greatest hindrance to our growth and maturity. In the temple for those few days, Jesus was asking questions and listening. Now, we don't have to think that those questions meant that Jesus was being critical of the Scriptures or that Jesus was being critical of his own call or of God. But Jesus was asking questions so that he could better understand and grow in wisdom as he prepared for his ministry on earth. Like Jesus, we must ask questions of the Scripture of each other, of our culture and society. As we move through God's story, we will read of Jesus constantly asking questions and also gladly receiving questions from those he interacts with. Pay attention to that in the coming weeks and months, how often Jesus asks questions and how often Jesus is glad to receive questions and to respond. And let's do the same. Finally, let's create a habit of listening to God and to each other. James says, be slow to speak and quick to listen. 
You see, listening is an act of faith because you put yourself in a position to learn something. And that's a vulnerable act. The act of listening is subversive and countercultural at a time when simply shouting above everyone else is the preferred method of communication. Jesus listened to those at the temple, and so we should do the same. When we listen, we can better understand God's story and our story. We can better understand the pain and the heartache and the fear and the anxiety of our neighbor. And we can better hear the joy and the excitement and become inspired by the good things God is doing around us when we listen. When we engage in holy listening, we sense what the Spirit is doing in our midst. First Baptist Church, I hope that together we'll resolve to be like the boy in the temple, who I do believe on that day and on many other days developed the habits of listening and asking questions and being present in the faith community. The proof is in the pudding, and we'll see it in the coming weeks as we explore and discover the things that Jesus did in his adult ministry. For now, I hope you'll join me in sharing in the amazement of today's text. Not so much the quirky story of a child being separated from his parents, but that together we'll resolve to be the church in light of the boy who asked questions, who listened, and sat with his faith community. May it be so for us in 2021. Let's pray together. God, we are in awe and amazed of this one story from Jesus' adolescence because it teaches us so much about how we are to grow in wisdom and how we are to mature. Help us to understand that growth does not cease when we turn 18 or when we exit our adolescent years, but that we continue to grow and mature in the faith. May we look to Jesus' example in the scripture. May we ask questions in order to grow. May we listen in order to grow and understand. And may we be committed to developing habits of being present with our faith community when given the opportunity. Lord, this is a year where we will seek to be more like Jesus. May we look to the boy in the temple on this first Sunday of the year to get our bearings so that we can better serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.